Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, thanks for joining us on a Friday afternoon, nearly evening. Uh, we do appreciate you kind of joining into the webinar. Um, thanks for taking the time. Uh, obviously, this is our third EdTech program webinar, and it's, uh, it's fun to do these. So we'll get, we'll get started. Uh, just go through a bit of kind of information about the webinar as well, maybe how you can get the most from it. If you do have any questions, uh, there is a chat feature within this Zoom window. So please, by all means, do send any questions you have. Um, there's going to be about a 10, 15 minute period at the end where you can, um, your questions, I'll make a note of them and I'll put them to our guest who's uh, David did out today. So any questions you have, by all means, at any point, no matter how daft, check them in the chat and I'll make sure that uh, David has a fair crack at them later. If you did want to have a copy of this video, it's obviously being recorded now. If you go to this website, so bit.ly forward slash edtechmail, and what that does is it signs you up to our newsletter. And all we do is it's not a constant stream of information, no spam, just every time we put together a webinar or a video, or we think some useful content that we're creating um, you know, on some level, we always just push it out to everyone who signs up. So that website might be of use to you. I'll share it later on. Okay, so the overview for today, I'm just going to do the welcome, we're in that now, uh, do some basic introductions. I'll then hand over to our guest, who'll be going through cognitive load theory. We'll have a Q&A probably starting around about five o'clock, maybe shortly after, and then we'll close hopefully about quarter past five, so about an hour of your time. So just to give you a bit of context about us and who we are, so um, this is kind of, I'm streaming out of King's Leadership Academy, so a free school, 11 to 18, in just outside of Warrington. Uh, this is our ninth year of being open. And the reason this webinar has been put on is, uh, some of you might be aware, the government released some funds for schools to take part in an ed tech program. It's the demonstrator program. The idea being um, some schools wanted a bit of guidance, help, support, and training just to help with their remote learning or blended learning um, in case we go to another lockdown or you know we have as i'm sure if you're working in education now you have pupils who are off for one reason or another so that's what we're trying to do so we do training for schools uh, support for senior leaders at all phases from primary through to university and this is just one of the aspects trying to find loads of different people who can share their expertise and kind of give it to you educators so you can give it to parents pupils or you know the staff that you work with so just some brief introduction. So my name is Benjamin Barker. I'm a vice principal here at King's, um, lead on teaching and learning. And as I mentioned before, this EdTech program, 12 years teaching, eight of them here at King's. And previously I was at Ormiston Academy in Runcorn, for anyone who knows the Northwest. And if you did want to reach out to me, um, you obviously have my email address from the Eventbrite tickets, but you can also get me on Twitter. And then the guests for today, obviously, uh, so David Dadao, so over 15 years of teaching, a founder of the Learning Spy blog. Apologies if you can hear a lawnmower in the background, the benefits of doing this from a school. Um, author of Making Kids Cleverer and Cleverer and What If Everything You Knew About Education Was Wrong. Also blogs out of learningspy.co.uk and you can contact him, I'm sure many ways, but one of them on Twitter, at David Dadao. So with all of the webinars we've been doing, we've been trying to focus on topics that we think are useful to teachers. And this one is kind of part of a series of this, uh, a, a series behind cognitive science, you know, like how do people learn? And you know, how does the mind work? How are memories made? And how we can take advantage of them? I think it's really important as educators, we know kind of like how the body work, works in this respect. And so I'm really excited to kind of invite David over um, to talk to us about cognitive load theory today. So I'm going to stop sharing. David, I did mute you. Apologies for that, but I'll uh, give you an opportunity to share your screen. And thanks very much. There we are. Um, am I, um, I think I'm speaking to you now. I'm unmuted. Thank you. Apparently. Well, thank you very much for having me, Benjamin. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you about, as Benjamin said, cog cognitive load theory. Uh, not so much a theory of learning, more a theory of instructional design. So based on some things that we know about how uh, people learn, Cognitive load theory suggests ways that we can design uh, educational experiences that are more likely to hit the mark. So let's begin. Before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of this, I've got, I want to talk, I want to begin by talking to you about learning in the broader sense. So if, if we're going to talk about learning, I think it makes sense 
to uh, define our terms. And this is my definition of learning that I'll, so whenever I say the word learning today, this is what I mean. Um, if you, uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't like that definition, that's, that's fine. That's okay. But at least you know what I mean. So I'm, I'm talking about two things, really, one of them being uh, retention, and the other being the ability to transfer things from the context in which you first learn them to new contexts. And so the, the first of these things, um, retention is about how long things last durability, and transfers about flexibility, how able we are to apply what we have learned in new contexts and environments. So with that in mind, one of the first things to say is that if we're, if we're happy with this definition, if we're prepared to accept this definition, it means that we can't really in any meaningful way talk about being able to see learning uh, because we can't see whether things are going to be retained or whether they're going to be transferred to, to new contexts. We can only make guesses about that. And so what we can see as, as teachers, whether live in the classroom, face to face, or in any kind of remote setting, all that we ever get to see is the performance of students um, within the context of the lesson. And from that, we can maybe start to make some guesses about what might be retained or be transferable to other places. And I think it's useful and important to think about learning and performance as different things. So uh, ap apologies for the picture here, which I have to confess is an internet fake. Um, a few moments of critical thinking would reveal that there's not really any way you'd be able to take that picture. But it doesn't matter because for our purposes, it's a visual metaphor. So the tip of the iceberg is what we get to see, what children do. And that can be anything from solving an equation, writing an essay, making a pencil case, um, playing a game of football, playing a musical instrument, any of those things, it's all performance. So if it's perceptible in the here and now, it is performance. But learning, which is what we're in the business of trying to generate, is, um, is, is, is something which doesn't take place in the here and now in quite, that, in quite the way that it would be comfortable for us if it did. It's a, it's a feature of the future. And as such, it's beneath the surface. It's not directly perceptible by us. So we can make guesses about what we think children are going to retain and transfer, but we can't ever observe it directly. Uh, we'd have to wait and we'd have to go elsewhere in order to see whether or not learning had taken place. And even then, we still don't have clear information about whether it will be transferred and to other contexts that we haven't yet visited or retained for durations of time that we haven't yet waited for. So there's this inherent tension at the heart of it between performance and learning. And so cognitive load theory is based on, as is much of cognitive psychology, on the, the model of working memory that, um, that we've had now for nigh on 50 years. And we've got a very simplified version of the working memory model here on your screens. And the, one of the important things to say about this model and every other model um, that we've got of the mind and how it works is that it important, it's important to know that this model is, it, is wrong. Uh, it's, uh, the human mind is much, much more complicated than this, but it's useful. And so all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this one I'm going to argue is useful because it allows us to make some predictions about what, uh, what students are likely to, to do in different um, circumstances. So the environment, uh, which currently consists of my voice and the picture I'm showing to you and, uh, and wherever you are in time and space, that environment is something to which you can only pay partial attention. So as adults, we typically pay somewhere about 1% of our attention is, is some, about our, we, we, we pick up about 1% of the environmental information available to us. And we're really, really good at focusing our attention on what we consider to be salient. Um, with um, younger children, their attention is much more diffuse. They find it harder to focus. So very, very young children, their attention is everywhere. They're, they're, they're distracted easily by everything. And as we mature, we get increasingly able to, to hone in and narrow our attention. So, but the site of attention is represented here by the workbench of working memory. So this is where all the thinking 
we ever do takes place. Every thought we've ever had takes place in our working memory. So in working memory, what we're doing is we're, is we're thinking about, we're attending to those things that we've, that we've picked up from the environment. And as soon as we pick something up from the environment, we also retrieve things which are in some way associated with what we're picking up that we've already experienced before. So anything, any prior knowledge, any prior learning, which seems relevant is, is retrieved at the time that we pay attention from our long-term memories. And then the more we know about a subject, the easier it is we find to, to make sense of what's in our environment, what we're attending to. And those, those thoughts churn in working memory and then the product, the process um, is stored uh, in long-term memory and, um, and then it, you, it's, it's a, a available for access later. So two things to point out at this stage. One is that working memory is strictly finite. There's relatively little space in our cluttered workbenches of, 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 of our minds. So typically uh, we, can, we can think about three to five things at once, probably no more than that, depending on complexity, probably quite a bit less than that. So we can hold a thought in mind, but when new ideas um, bubble up from the environment, then we're likely to lose hold of what we were holding on to before. Long-term memory, which I've got here represented by um, a still from a film. Uh, some of you might recognize it as from the closing scenes of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, a vast warehouse full of crates in, in, this, in this representation. Now, unlike working memory, um, we don't have any sense of what our long-term memory is like. Nobody has the ability to introspect their long-term memory because, as I said, all our thinking takes place in working memory. So we can, we can only make guesses about what it might be like there. And we, we know we must have something along the lines of long-term memory because we can think about things and then we can stop thinking about them for a bit and then we can think about them a bit later. And, and so it's clear that, that things must go somewhere where, when we're not thinking about them. And that's what we've come over the centuries to think of as memory. And so long-term memory for all practical purposes is infinite. You're never gonna run out of space. Uh, there's enough room in there to store every experience that you will have over your long lives. But, and this is where the, uh, the reference to the Raiders of the Lost Ark comes in, you can't always remember the things that you stored in long-term memory. They're not always accessible. So when, as I'm sure you know, when Indiana Jones brings the Ark of the Covenant back, uh, well, I say back, he nicks it, doesn't he? He steals it and takes it to America and the American government take it off him. They nail it in a crate, which they label top secret and store in a warehouse full of identical crates. And the implication is it's safe but nobody will ever find it again. And that's a little bit like some of the things that we have locked in our head. They're, they're in there and we may sometimes know that they're in there, but we don't have access to those ideas in the here and now. So that's the working memory model. And, and, it's, and it's important to know that that is what cognitive load theory is based upon. So a couple of points briefly to, to make about um, the process of learning and thinking. And I'm gonna share these with you as a series of quotations. So this is quite a well-known one. Most people will, uh, many people will be aware of this quote from Paul Kirshner, John Sweller and Richard Clark's paper uh, about minimal guidance. And they say that amongst many other things, they say in that paper that if nothing's changed in long-term memory, nothing has been learned. So that's, there might be all sorts of other things happening when we learn, but if there isn't a change in long-term memory, it wasn't learning. It needs to have at least that for us to think about it as in terms of learning. This second quote comes from Daniel Kahneman's uh, bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. And one of the, the points that Kahneman makes in that book, one, again, one of them, very uh, many, many points, is that anything that occupies our working memory reduces our capacity to think. So he uh, ran some experiments about how fast people could walk and still perform mental calculations. And basically it turns out that you can't walk very fast at all and do sums in your head. And if the sum is sufficiently complex, then you, uh, you, you need to stand still. And you can experiment with this on Monday when you're back at school and you can, when you see some students striding across um, down a corridor, you can call out to them and say, what's 
13 times 60 or something like that. And they will either, one of two things will happen, they'll either ignore you and carry on, but if they try to solve the sum, they will almost certainly stop walking in order to have the cognitive capacity to be able to think about the mathematics involved. So anything that occupies our working memory, even maintaining walking speed, reduces the capacity that we have to think. So that's the, the second point. And the third, another very well-known um, quotation, this time from uh, Daniel Willingham's book, Why Don't Students Like School? And Willingham says, again, amongst many, many other things, this beautifully poetic phrase that memory is the residue of thought. We remember the things that we think about, but anything that occupies our working memory reduces our capacity to think. So if we're having to think about a number of things, we'll pay attention to a number of things, or that there are a number of things which might, which might distract us, then all of those will be reducing our capacity to think. And if you think in terms of a, of a typical lesson, there's the teacher and, the, and the, 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 the lesson content material that the teacher is, is trying to impart and get children to think about. But there are going to be competing demands and some of those might come from students, some of them might come from outside the classrooms like, like Benjamin's lawnmower at the beginning of the webinar. And some of them might inadvertently be provided by the teacher themselves. So very often, and I've done this, certainly done this myself, in an effort to engage um, students, I've tried to make the context in the, of the teaching more interesting and in so doing, children have thought about the context to the detriment of the content. So I'll give you an example of this when trying to teach um, students about the, the background to Seamus Heaney's poetry uh, in an effort to get them to think about and empathise with the life of an Irish peasant uh, potentially starving to death during the potato blight um, in the, uh, the 19th century. In an effort to get them to do that, I once um, had taught a lesson where we hid some potatoes in the classroom, but not quite enough for all of the students in the lesson. So they, after the lesson had been introduced and explained why they were doing this, we told them, now imagine you're an Irish peasant, see if you can find some potatoes. And the students had great fun looking for potatoes and some of them found them and survived and some didn't and starved to death. And, uh, and they all really, really enjoyed it. And then the following lesson, um, I, in, a, in discussion with a colleague, we were we wanted to find out how much children had learned from that lesson. We were of the opinion going into this that they would probably have learned a lot because because they were so engaged. And so, the following lesson, we simply began by asking what they remembered of the previous lesson, and they all remembered the activity about looking for potatoes. And they you know they would say, "Oh, I know, I found one under the desk." You know, I didn't, I died. And, uh, and they have the very clear and vivid memories of that experience. And we then probed a bit and said, so why were we doing that? What was the purpose? And very few of them could remember anything at all. Even those that could remember a bit had a very sketchy idea about the purpose. And they had spent the, a good deal of the lesson thinking about the likely hiding places for potatoes in a classroom. And because that's what they'd thought about, that's what they'd learned. That was the change that had occurred in their long-term memory. And that even though they'd briefly been introduced to the idea of um, Seamus Heaney's poetry and the experiences of Irish peasants, that wasn't what they'd thought about. And so that's not the change that took place in long-term memory. Their, their thinking about potatoes reduced their capacity to think about the content we were hoping that they would learn. And there's a central and important message there, which cognitive load theory picks up. Before we get into that though, let's have a little bit of a think about some th a theorized idea about what we think happens in long-term memory. And I say think because we, we're not at all sure. This is a theory which again is, is almost certainly wrong, but useful. And you've probably um, already heard about schemas. And this is essentially how we think schemas are built up. So the green dot there on the screen represents an item of knowledge. And so in this case, we're going to make it uh, an item of vocabulary from a foreign language. So that green dot um, is the phrase ni hao. And uh, if you know what that means already, then you have a link between these two green dots. The second of the green dots has appeared is what ni hao means in English. And so if, and I'm confident that everyone listening to the webinar will have that second green dot already. So you now have two 
green dots in, in, in your long-term memory. One is the sound ni hao, and the other is what ni hao means in English. Now, those of you that know what it means have a link between those two things. And that link means that in the future, if you're asked a question such as what does ni hao mean, or given the English word and said, and then asked for it in another language, you, we, there's the possibility that you might retrieve it. Now, those of you that don't know what ni hao means, what we're going to do now live uh, during this session is we're going to make a link between ni hao and what it means in English. And so what, it, what ni hao means in English is, hello. And you already knew that, you already knew the English word hello, but now we've got a connection between the two. So we've now, we've now introduced the possibility that you will be able to remember that information in the future. It's not certainly, it's certainly by no means um, guaranteed, but we've introduced the possibility. Now, if I were to continue, this obviously would be a very different webinar, but if I were to continue teaching you Mandarin vocabulary and giving you more items, what would happen is that each new uh, piece of Mandarin vocabulary would add to your Mandarin schema. And, and each item would reinforce and make it easier for you to remember every other item. And the more you knew, the easier it is to, to remember, to recall all you know, until the point, some point in the future, with enough practice and effort, you'd become fluent. And once you're fluent, it's impossible to forget ni hao. In the same way, as if you're a fluent English speaker, it's impossible to forget hello. It's, it's absurd to imagine two people meeting in the street and one of them says, hello, and the other one says, no, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I know oh, it's in there somewhere, I can't remember what that, help me out. It just, it would never happen, it's impossible. And in fact, our, our capacity with our native language, any language we're fluent with is so great that we can actually have conversations on autopilot without engaging our conscious mind at all. And so you might have had this experience in the past, maybe maybe it's been your birthday and somebody said to you at work, somebody said, happy birthday. And you might have automatically found yourself replying, yeah, you too. And uh, then there's that slight awkward moment as you realize it's not their birthday and they realize you weren't really paying attention. And, and But this is evidence that we can, with, with knowledge that has become fluent, when schemas become that well developed, we don't, they don't take up any space at all in our working memory. Um, they're used automatically. Uh, and certainly in terms of listening, that's clear how that might work. So that's um, a brief uh, potted history about how, how schema might work. So the role of long-term memory is quite interesting. And what I'm gonna do now, I'll just, I've just flashed up some numbers there, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how long-term memory makes things easier. So the numbers I just flashed up, I'm gonna flash up again. And if you're interested, if you can be bothered uh, at this time on a Friday evening, your, your, your mission is to try and memorize the string of digits. And I'm just gonna show you them for five seconds. If you're interested, you can have a go at trying to remember them. Uh, you Obviously you can cheat and write them down, but you'd only be cheating yourself. So it's up to you. And here they are. Okay, so now if you want to, you can challenge yourself and see if you can if you can recall those numbers. And it's it's perfectly possible to do this, and many people do it successfully. But it does take quite a bit of effort. And if people are successful, what they tend to be what they tend to do is chunk those that string of numbers into four three digit strings. So six zero one six eight one one two nine one six six, and that's much much easier for our working memories to deal with than twelve single digit numbers. Um, so chunking into 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 um, small into smaller numbers, um, a, a few, fewer numbers, um, that, then it, that it makes it quite um, quite a bit easier for us to cope with. But what I'm going to do now, by to, de to, to demonstrate the role of long term memory, I'm going to give you the same string of numbers, but in a different order. And this time, your ability to recall them will probably be relatively effortless because they have some kind of relevance probably. So most people watching will very, very quickly recognize that these are dates um, and that those dates have particular relevance. So 1066, of course, 
Battle of Hastings, 1812, Tchaikovsky's Overture, and uh, 1966, there was some sort of sporting event. Um, not sure what, not sure if you remember that. So though that information, because it has a separate life in long-term memory, it's much, much easier, easier for us to handle that data. Here's a more everyday example. So if you look at this sentence here, um, it's a relatively straightforward sentence but it's really difficult for most people to process this and it's difficult because the the acronyms here the the the, the, the bits in bold uh, are unfamiliar and so they act like little black holes sucking your attention into them and making it much much harder for you to process what's essentially quite straightforward and this is because you don't know what they mean and I know you don't know what they mean because I've made them up and if I replace them with acronyms that you do recognize, you can see how easy it is to make sense of the sentence. And the difference between those two sentences is what's in your long-term memory. So essentially the, the, the rule is that any relevant knowledge in long-term memory makes any associated task in the here and now much, much easier. The more you know, the easier it will be to perform a very wide range of tasks. So uh, one final example to show you before we move on, this is the Wasson selection task. And what you're gonna see here is four different cards. And the, and the question is, what's the fewest number of cards that you need to turn over to test the claim that if a card shows three on one side, the opposite side will show the letter M. So I'm just gonna give you a moment to chew over that instruction and see if you want to see if you can uh, work out the answer to it uh, if you're struggling try not to feel too bad because when this uh, the this test is conducted in laboratory conditions fewer than 10 percent of people uh, are able to work out the answer we find it a very challenging task but that's because the, the superficial information there it doesn't have any meaning for us. If we repeat the same task with a context which is more familiar, such as detecting cheating in a social situation, it becomes much easier. So now the cards represent people and drinks. And so if we have these cards, uh, 16, 18, Coke and beer, we've got a 16 year old and 18 year old a glass of Coca-Cola and a glass of beer. And the claim is that if a, a card has alcohol on one side, it must have an 18 year old or older on the other, then, um, then it becomes much, much easier for us to see how we test this. So we know that we'd have to turn over the 16, see what the 16 year old is drinking. And we also know that we need to check the beer to see if the beer's been drunk by someone who's under 18. We're not interested in what the 18 year olds are drinking and we're not interested in who's drinking Coke. And you apply this same situation to the Wasson selection task. And it still takes most people a while to work out how that uh, essentially very simple task, the detecting social cheating task maps on to this one, but it's essentially exactly the same puzzle. The context of the second one makes it much, much easier for our minds to work out how to do it. And that's an important piece of information because we are really, really good at working out and solving social problems. We're really bad or we're much worse at trying to solve abstract problems um, with things that we've had to learn the hard way. And of course, school is all about that kind of learning. So let's just review where we've got to so far um, and think about some of the things that we need to, to think about going forward and see how cognitive load theory fits into all of this. So firstly, there's a bottleneck created by our ability to process information in our working memory, which means that in a classroom setting, students have got enough capacity to try and solve problems and to solve problems, to complete tasks, complete activities and uh, find solutions. And uh, they can definitely do that. They also are able to concentrate on performing tasks which contribute to building up increasingly fluent schema, which means that they will uh, over time find, find associated tasks increasingly effortless. But they probably can't do both of those things at once. 
especially if what they've been asked to do is sufficiently complex. And so this is one of the really difficult counterintuitive ideas at the heart of the problem that cognitive load theory is trying to solve, that we don't have typically enough capacity in our working memory to solve problems and learn how learn the solution for later. And so that it's perfectly possible for students to solve problems that you give them in lessons and not remember how to do it later. And as an example of that, uh, I give you the clock in my car. And uh, as with most people, the clock in my car is wrong a couple of times a year. And most of the clocks in my life are really easy to, to solve. Like my kitchen clock, I just wind it on and my phone resets itself automatically without any effort. But the, the manufacture of car clocks um, is, is, is less straightforward. And so what, what typically happens to me is that I, you know, I notice the time is wrong and I, normally well, I pull it, I'm at a red light waiting and I sort of think, oh, I'll just reset it. And, and I realise that hitting a random combination of dashboard buttons doesn't seem to work. And eventually I'll pull over somewhere safe and get the manual out, look up how to reset my clock and successfully solve the problem. But with the full and complete knowledge that in six months time, I'll be in exactly the same situation. I'll retain nothing useful except look in the manual. And, uh, and that's pretty much what happens in a lot of classroom settings, that children perform really, really well. Their performance is great. They do what we've asked them to do. They solve the equation, they write the essay, they make the pencil case, whatever it was we wanted them to do. But what we can't see and what they can't see and what we won't know until later is what they'll retain and what they'll transfer. And what I'm suggesting is, and what we've got good evidence to support, is that if we're asking children to focus on complex problems, we decrease the likelihood that they will remember the solutions to those problems in the future. And so there's an interesting conundrum. So let's recap a little bit. So firstly, we've talked about working memory being really limited. Um, so there's relatively, so uh, we can think about four things, plus or minus one, typically which we think of as chunks. Long-term memory though is limitless and um, information without us wanting to do it, without us, uh, this is completely unbidden, seems to organize itself into these densely interrelated um, networks of information that psychologists call schema. And a schema can help overcome the limits of working memory. So a really clunky analogy here, the, 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 this um, four pin socket um, that's, that's on your screen, that's, that represents working memory capacity. Once I've, I've filled the, the, each of the plugs with, with utilities, I can't, if to plug in anything else, I have to unplug something. But having relevant schema that I can draw on in long-term memory is like being able to plug in a whole new adapter and, and freeing up some space a little bit. It's a bit of a clunky analogy, but it helps make the point. So I've got here now um, a tweet from everybody's favourite educationalist, Professor Dylan William, um, from a couple of years ago, where he uh, tweeted, quite a famous tweet now, it's quite notorious in some circles, where he suggests that um, John Sweller's cognitive load theory might be the single most important thing for teachers to know about. Uh, and there's a link there to Sweller's re research. So there's a lot said and there's a lot written about cognitive load theory. And I'm going to suggest to you an awful lot of stuff that's out there is, is interesting and it's certainly worth knowing, but it's not, most of it is a bit of a distraction from what teachers actually need to know thinking about lessons in their classroom. And then, so this simple um, equation that I've got on the screen, I've, I've shamelessly stolen from Adam Boxer. It's on one of his blogs, which I should really reference, and I, I haven't got the link to it, but it's, uh, I, I definitely commend Adam Boxer's blog to you. And he suggests uh, that a really good way of thinking about the cognitive load involved in any particular task is to think about the demand of the task, how hard is it, and then that is divided by, mitigated by the, the resources that we have available to us to think about solving that problem. So available resources can be broken down in two different ways. Now, ideally, the resources that we've got available to us are internal. They're in our own long-term memory. If they're in our own long-term memory, then we retrieve the information about how to solve the task and we solve it pretty successfully, pretty quickly. Clearly, most of the students we teach are not going to be in that position yet. And so they were, we're relying, they're relying also on external resources. So a teacher is an external resource. The questions you ask, the feedback you give, 
all of that um, back and forwards is an external resource. In addition, you might supply textbooks or you might construct other resources, you might put up displays in your classroom, all of which are designed perhaps to reduce the cognitive load that children experience to enable them to deal with complex tasks. So one of the things I think is really important to be wary of, to be, and certainly to be aware of, is that the more readily available external resources are, the less motivated students are going to be to internalise those resources. So if, it's, if all they need to do is look up and, at your display and find the answer to the question, they're far less likely to invest the cognitive effort to memorise that information. Um, and so they're going to be increasingly dependent on the resources available to them in the teaching environment. And I had a really interesting example of this um, some while ago, visiting a primary school where um, the question was, we're, we, they said, we're really trying hard to get children to learn times tables, but we're not really being as successful as we'd hope to be. We're not sure what the problem was. And part of the problem was that they had, all of the students in that school had a number square stuck into the back of their numeracy book. So whenever they had to do any multiplication, they simply look at the back of the books. And so there's very little, um, there's very little incentive to Remember, to memorise the times tables and so they were undercutting themselves by having that resource too readily available. So one of the things that's important is to have a plan for getting rid of external resources, for getting rid of yourself. Essentially children leave, they, they leave your class, they leave school and they, they need to be independent. If they're relying on you or anything that you're supplying then they are dependent. So how do we get rid of that over time is a central question. The second thing to think about is the it is, is around the, the top part of the equation the demand of the task itself and we can think about that in terms of quantity and quality so we're really quite good at thinking in terms of quality we typically as teachers we say right, here's an here's an easy version of a problem and here's a moderately more difficult one and here's a tough one and we're really sensible about saying let's start with the easy one and that's exactly right where we're less sensible i think is in thinking about quantity and i think typically we overestimate how much children are capable of doing before they experience cognitive overload. So as an example of that, I think typically we ask students, especially younger students, to write too much. Um, we ask them to do extended writing. And what happens is, you know, the first few sentences, the first paragraph might be sufficiently high quality, but over time, the quality is likely to deteriorate. And that's because they've become increasingly exhausted by the effort of maintaining um, the cognitive load of having to do high quality writing. And so by getting them to do too much too soon, what ends up happening is that children practice doing rubbish writing. So they get better at writing badly, which is completely counterproductive. The solution might be to do less for longer to put much more effort into doing short bursts of really high quality work. So in the, in the case of writing, much, much more sentence level analysis, where students are writing really good quality sentences, which enable you to really ramp up the, uh, the quality of the task, the task demand. But because the quantity of the task is relatively low, children were, were less likely to experience cognitive overload. And with more practice like that, we're more likely to build the sort of sus sustainability and, res and resilience we're hoping for um, in building with children's um, uh, ability to write for extended periods. It's worth thinking about it in terms of um, interval training in physical exercise, so like couch to 5k. If you did couch to 5k of a lockdown, that perfectly uh, takes into account the physical load of running. And instead of saying we want you to start straight away by running five kilometers which would be impossible for most of the people doing the program they start you by doing a 60 second run it's still demanding for most people but it's it's achievable enough that we're likely to believe that it's worth persevering so if we don't get the quantity right we might well inadvertently be teaching children that they you know what's the point in trying i'm just going to fail and i think that happens all, all too often uh, another bit to think about uh, briefly is the idea of task switching. So it's worth knowing that this goes back to the point we were saying earlier about anything that occupies our attention reduces our capacity to think. We can't multitask. Uh, we can't. Multitasking is 
being able to concentrate on two or more cognitive processes with no loss of um, accuracy or speed. And it's just not something human beings can do. What we do instead is task switch. So we divert our attention between two tasks. And this diagram here um, illustrates how much that might work. So we start on a task. Let's imagine, for instance, a student is doing some revision and then they get distracted. Maybe they check their phone, their social media status. And so when they do that, they pay a task switching penalty where they sort of may have to mentally reorganize. But that doesn't matter because we don't care if they make mistakes in their social media uh, posting. Well, they might, but we're less likely to. But when they switch back to um, rev their revision, during the process of, of switching schema, they're much more likely to make mistakes. They're much going to be much more error prone as the mind engages in reinstatement searches to get back on its mental track. And so every time we do that, we increase the chance of error and we, in, we increase the time it takes to do anything. We're much, much better off not trying to divert our attention, either students doing this or teachers inadvertently doing it with uh, classroom activities, which force children to task switch. And this can be really, really subtle. So sometimes we ask children to task switch by giving them a, maybe a picture to look at and then a description of the picture on a, on a different piece of paper. And they're having to divert their attention between the two sources. Each time they do that, each time they switch between the diagram and the information, they're gonna be paying a task switching penalty, which reduces their capacity to uh, absorb the information without making errors. So, thinking about how all this works um, for experts and we're all experts um, relatively speaking we might feel a bit embarrassing to say but we're all experts um, as teachers so we're teaching things which we're relative experts in and that means that we've got lots and lots of relevant information in long-term memory and so we can you can give us quite complex tasks that um, are connected to what we're experts in and we won't need much guidance. We'll, we'll add the new experience of successfully solving the problem to the store of relevant information, the schema in our long-term memory. But for a novice, it tends not to work like that. I mean, we're, we're all novices as well. We're all rubbish at something. There's something that we haven't practiced yet. So I found um, uh, out not so long ago that I'm a, being a complete novice at making souffles meant that uh, it put me in quite a vulnerable position and so as a, as a novice souffle maker, I got my um, cook recipe from the cookbook. I bought my ingredients and I was working through. And one step of the recipe presented me with some problems because it asked me to meet, beat the, uh, the various ingredients um, of, the, of the mixture together until the recipe book said, until the consistency is just right. Now, not knowing what just right looked like, that was presented some difficulties. I, I guessed and what I thought just right might be. There was an attempt to describe what just right might be, but I, it was hard for me to visualize it or, or feel it. And so the likelihood is I didn't get it just right. And when I put it into the oven, the souffle didn't rise. And it was all a bit of a sad mess, very stressful experience. And what I learned, it's not that learning stopped. I did learn something, but what I learned was negative. I learned that I don't ever want to make a souffle ever again. I'll just buy one if I want one. Uh, but this is what happens to students. They learn, I'm, I'm rubbish at maths, I can't do French, I can't read. That's what they store in their long-term memory. The next time they have a go at reading or maths or whatever it is, French, uh, there's now something relevant in there. They have a relevant thing to draw on, but it's not useful. They say to themselves, oh, I've tried this before. Yeah, I was rubbish last time, what's the point? And, and that's where we get cognitive overload. And that's what we're gonna try and avoid. And we avoid it essentially by giving novices expert guidance. So we supplement the lack in their long-term memory by providing the external resources needed to be able to successfully complete tasks. So we do all of these things to help them develop a schema of success. And the, what's going into their long-term memory is, is some of it is going to be the relevant information needed to be independent in the future. But more importantly than that, is they're getting the experience of being successful within that domain. So that in the next time we ask them to, to, to do some maths or reading or French, that they have, when they're, 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 they're now, they're going, oh yeah, no, I've done that before. I tried it. It was kind of okay. I, I managed it. And then slowly over time, we decrease the amount of support 
to help them, encourage them to invest the cognitive, their cognitive resources in remembering, in, 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 in internalizing resources so that they become increasingly independent. And that's really the basis of cognitive load theory. So there's one important thing to talk about, or one of the, which is called the expertise reversal effect. And it speaks to this difference between novices and experts. And remember, we're all novices, we're all experts. But in the classroom situation, it's the likelihood is that we're the expert and our students are the novice. So cognitive load theory predicts, and there's quite a lot of empirical support for this, is that if you're a novice, you're going to be much better off given explicit step-by-step -step guidance with lots of works, examples, modeling, scaffolding, really rapid feedback, and all of these things which let you know you're on the right track. If you're an expert though, that's not gonna be the case. As an expert, you're much more likely to be successful if you're told, go off and that, you know, play, have a play with this problem, see what, see what you can come up with. Now, because we're experts, what might happen, what sometimes happens in, the, in an education context is that we, teachers make the assumption that what works for us might well work best for our students. But in fact, we should maybe make the contrary assumption that what works best for us as experts is really unlikely to be uh, effective for our novice learners. We'd be much more likely to be successful if we were to think about what's not going to be the best approach for me. And so, and so that's a really important, I think, rule of thumb to have um, hanging around for us, that we're looking for something that isn't intuitively, doesn't intuitively feel good to us. Because as a, all experts are prone to experiencing what's sometimes called the curse of knowledge or expertise-induced blindness. And what that means is we massively overestimate what other people know. Um, there was a great experiment done um, some years ago now where uh, subjects were divided up into two groups. So there was an expert group and a novice group and the experts were given uh, a list of 120 or so popular songs and they were, they, there was some coaching given so they, they made sure that they knew all of the songs, knew the, the rhythms and melodies, all of that sort of thing and were, were really knowledgeable about the songs on the list. The novice group weren't given the list and then you had novices and experts paired up and the experts were asked to tap out the rhythm of their song and then the novice would have to guess what they were tapping out so they'd be there going and and the novices is it this and it, what happened is that we found out perhaps unsurprisingly that novices are really bad at this so the people that didn't, the novices, the guessers, were uh, on average got about 2% of the answers right of the 120 songs they were asked to listen to. But what was really, really interesting was the guess that the, the expert group, the tappers, made about how many they thought their listener partner would, had correctly gotten. So they, tappers were estimating that listeners were correctly guessing about 50%, a massive overestimation. And this is likely to be the, what's going on in our own minds when we're thinking about uh, learning design, lesson planning, we will be massively overestimating what our students know, what they're likely to be able to achieve, and so on. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we're constantly confronted with this feedback and we, can, we, can, we, become, we become better at it over time at anticipating that they're gonna struggle with that. That kind of vocabulary is really gonna get in the way, but we're still prone. We're always prone to this overestimation. It's, it's, it's hard to wipe out even if we're really aware about it. So um, the, what, we're on the home straight now. Um, so he, here are some thoughts about how teachers can optimize cognitive load. So bear, drawing all together these strands of the theory, what can we do to optimize the cognitive load that children are experiencing in the classroom so that they're more likely to develop the schema in long-term memory they need to be able to apply those schema in the future in new contexts. The aims of learning are long-term. Short-term aims are satisfying and look good, but they're often at odds with long-term aims. So for beginners, for novices, these are the things that we should assume are much, much more likely to be effective, whatever beginners are trying to learn and whoever they are, however old they are. So beginners benefit, disproportionately benefit from being given clear works examples where they're given a problem, which is talked through 
maybe maybe there's a piece of writing that a, that a teacher talks through and explains how it fits together. Maybe it's a diagram, maybe it's a mathematics problem, but something like that. They're given really clear instructions, really clear broken down information uh, that they need to know, which is constantly reviewed and, quest and questions asked to make sure that it is secure that they are they have the task model to them and then that when the task is handed over it's heavily scaffolded and they're given really clear step-by-step -step feedback in order to build up this idea of the schema of success so that slowly bit by bit eventually they become increasingly independent so as students become increasingly expert, as they move through the course that you're teaching them, as they move through the year, as they get to the point where they're going to leave you, um, that we might want to be thinking about some of these things. So faded instruction, where we leave out bits of information, where we say to students, I've told you this before. What did I tell you before when we were doing this? Can you remember? And we make it slightly harder for them. We make, so we, by, by doing so, we're communicating to them that it's important for them to retrieve what they already know so that they become independent. We might start giving them goal-free problems where instead of giving a, a really clear question, it's been found that if you give, instead of, um, you know, the, the typical example is a, a maths question where there's a, you know, the, the, they have to, students have to find a particular angle. Instead of doing that, give them um, shapes and give them all the different angles to find and, and give really open-ended questions like, find out as much information as you can from this diagram. Goal-free problems are really beneficial to more expert students, students who've, moved, who've graduated from being complete novices. It's, it's useful at this stage possibly to increase the amount of choice and autonomy that students have in how to complete tasks. And it's also useful to think about delaying and summarizing the feedback that we give. If, we, if we're still giving really um, immediate step-by-step -step feedback later on, then we're making it harder for students to remember this information for later. So we're much better off withholding some of our feedback to help them invest their cognitive resources in that process of internalization. So just to, just to finish off then, we've got some key points. So the first of that is that to re, re, just to constantly orientate ourselves upon this idea that the goals of learning are long term. What students can do in your lesson is, is not nothing, it's not irrelevant, but it's a poor guide to what they're going to be able to do elsewhere and later. So if, with an eye to the future, it's much more useful to spend lesson time when students are novices on building up the capacity to be able to solve problems later rather than investing too much time at the beginning on problem solving and then finding out that they although they solved the problem they can't remember how to do it cognitive load theory is the, the its main use is is about instructional design hopefully helping us design lessons and learning experiences which are focused on schema building and that is all about connecting up the ideas that we're given, asking them to think about things that we've already told them to, giving, giving them the experience of doing these things with lots and lots of help and support, lots and lots of feedback so that they become successful, so that later we take that, or what, that structure and support away. And they are, because they have the experience of success, they're much more likely to cope with the additional difficulty and so on. And the third point to make is that as novices and as experts, we think differently. And this is true of all of us, because as I said, we're all novices, we're all experts. When we're thinking about a subject where we're relative experts, we think entirely differently when we're thinking within subjects where we're relative novices. And so it's important for us to recognize and remember that what works best for one is unlikely to be effective for the other. And it's difficult for us because as adults, we rarely put ourselves in the position of being complete novices. Typically, adults only do tasks that they're at least competent at. It's a, you know when we when we have those life experiences of, for instance, learning how to drive or first training to be a teacher, that we're putting ourselves in positions where we're incompetent at something, and trying to remember what it was like at the beginning of those experiences is a really really important guide for how we should interact with our more novice students. I hope um, some of that was interesting and useful. Um, if you'd like to find out more, then do please uh, get in touch. And hopefully you've got some questions now. 
Um, all of the things that I've talked about are available uh, on my blog, which uh, addresses at the bottom. And I've also written some books, which uh, there's one out next month called Intelligent Accountability. If, uh, if you're interested, do have a look. But thanks ever so much so far. And now, Ben, have you got any, Benjamin, have you got any questions for me? Yeah, I do. So, yes, yeah, thanks for all of that. It's fascinating. And I think, um, I think I've taken loads from it. I've got my new behavior management strategy. So when kids are running away, I'm going to shout mental maths at them. That's a good <laughs> one. Um, you also mentioned Adam Boxer. So, yeah, his blog, yeah. for anyone who's interested, is called A Chemical Orthodoxy. So um, that might be a place for someone to go. So, Absolutely. yeah, so um, I had two that were sent through. So a couple of weeks ago, we spoke to Flavia Bellum and we were asking her, what are maybe some misconceptions that we could take back to staff and, you know, they could stop doing or pupils could stop doing straight away. And she was saying from a revision point of view, you know, when pupils read their notes or copy up notes or highlight notes, just from a learning point of view, she was saying those things are not the most effective way to spend your time. So thinking about cognitive, I know you mentioned a few of these during your talk, but if you were going to, if we could get a message out to like every staff room on Monday morning, just to go, just based on what you've been talking about today, if people could stop doing something or, you know, maybe just consider how they plan differently, what would be maybe the one thing you would tell them, um, you know, that takes into account some of the things you've been speaking about today to help the planning? Okay. Well, if there was one thing I could tell them, I would reiterate the idea that the goals of learning are long term. So what children can do here and now is, is not a very good predictor on what they'll be able to do later on. And so if we align teaching to the future, which is inherently difficult because we're, you know, if you're asking teachers to, to, to teach in a way which won't, the fruits won't be revealed until later, it's hard for, it's hard to think like that. Um, we, it's much easier for us to rehearse performances and get children looking slick at things in the here and there. But knowing that that might be ineffective for the long term, I think is probably the most important um, factor. If I was allowed to give a second piece of information, you are. it would be to remind <laughs> teachers that, uh, of the difference between how we think as experts and how we think as novices and to and to remember that we're prone to overestimating what students are going to be able to do and what they what they know and we're also any guidance we take in lesson planning on what's likely to be effective for us is likely to be a red herring um, and we should we should disregard that information if it works for us that do, is not a good guide as to what's what's going to be effective for a novice Okay, yeah, thanks for that. And then I think we've probably got time for one more. So obviously with uh, like the books that you write and just this stuff that you've been going through today, I'm sure there's a, a lot of research that goes into it. If the people who are watching or those who might watch this later or listen to it, where would you recommend them going to read more? Would it just be, um, you know, uh, you've put some net authors and some dates of papers in this presentation. Is there a book that sums up these ideas well? Yeah. Okay. Well, there, there are, there's lots in, I mean, there's a couple of books out just, just now about cognitive load theory in particular, but I, I would really recommend, if, if you want to really understand the basics of this, and I, which I think is probably the most important thing, the book I'd recommend isn't about cognitive load theory at all, doesn't even mention it um, ex, explicitly, but it's Daniel Willingham's Why Don't Students Like School? And I think that, that getting a good grounding there actually gives you... A, the wherewithal to understand and make use of some of the more technical um, work that's out there on the specifics of cognitive load theory. So I'd that would be my top number one recommendation. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll link that in the notes to this video and yeah, that, one more last one. Um, so uh, Jamie Powell says, what could you do to help students who may be experiencing a cognitive overload in your lesson? Right. So uh, put in the support because what you don't want them doing, it, you know, this is where the, 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 the performance in the lesson is important. What you don't want them doing is leaving your lesson with the belief that, that they can't do it, that they're rubbish at this particular aspect of the subject. So it may be that you need to step in and give them, you know, much more support than you thought you needed to, that they need far more modeling or much more scaffolding or, you know, to be given a resource which makes it almost impossible for them to fail. And if they're experiencing that kind of, I can't do it, I can't do it, that sort of, that thing that, that, that is associated with cognitive overload, getting past that and going, look, here, you can, there's what it looks like. You know, for me, as a souffle maker, if a chef had patted me on the shoulder and went, that's what it's meant to look like, you know, let's get it in the oven at that stage. That's the kind of support I would have needed. So it's trying to gauge that 
and make sure that they don't fail. I mean, there's a lot of, I think, very unproductive guff spoken about the importance of failure. And uh, you've got to have experienced an awful lot of success before you can cope with failure. And I think that within the education system, far too many children uh, don't experience enough success and so are not at all equipped to deal with any kind of failure. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that one. I think that answered that question well. So um, just as a reminder, if anybody wants to have access to the resources, also the links that David mentioned at various points in the talk or the video itself, uh, this is the website to kind of send your email address into um, and then we'll get it pushed out. It'll go out this weekend. I just want to say on behalf of us at the school and the EdTech program, David, a massive thanks for joining us, you know, at this time on a Friday. Everything you've been through has been fantastic and hopefully things staff can pick up with and take their own schools and share within, you know, their own training and so on. Um, I'll share all the details we mentioned and Dave's contacts as well. So if you did want to get in contact with him, then I'm sure he'll be more than happy to kind of point you in the right direction. I'll speak with you. But David, thanks again for your time today. Thanks very much, Benjamin. Hey everyone, so that's kind of that's the end for us here. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and uh, we may see you for a future webinar. Take care.